Thank you all for giving a wonderful presentation yesterday, talking about um, your journey from being a graduate student to now being starting up your own research group in Karma. And I just have a few questions who were not there at your talk yesterday, but still want to learn from your trajectory. So, as you know, a lot of PhD students, after they finish their graduate studies, feel a bit burnt out. And they're kind of at odds about whether they should just jump into a postdoc or what else they should do in either in academia or going to pharmaceuticals. So, maybe just shed some light on your experience and what you did after you finished your PhD. So yeah, as I said yesterday, after my PhD, I actually took a break for just about two years, mm -hmm. um, where I mostly did un primarily undergraduate teaching. Um, for me, it was it was nice because I did feel you know I had a long my PhD had taken you know, for around six years. Mm -hmm. um, I'd come right out of undergrad, worked for a year, and then gone into my PhD. So I felt a bit tired. I felt you know, it'd been a hard slog. Yeah. So I felt I a little bit burnt out. And I felt that it would be nice to have a change of pace where I could focus on teaching and interacting with undergraduate students mm -hmm. um, I, I, away from hardcore bench science. Um, and actually, in my case, it was a, an arrangement I'd already reached with the university mm -hmm. to do this. So I kind of had already committed myself to a period that I would, I would teach. Mm -hmm. um, but in my case, I felt it, it not only gave me a chance to recuperate, but actually the energy and reminded me why I like research because after about a year and a half, I could feel I was really missing research, and I was I was keen to find a way to get back to doing research. I realized as much as I liked teaching, mm -hmm. um, a career where I did predominantly teaching was not really what I wanted. Um, I wanted a way to have sort of a lot of research, some interaction with students, of course, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted my main focus to be research, and then research that was relevant to Africa. So I was teaching undergraduates in the US, mm -hmm. and you know, I enjoyed it, I learned a lot, but I couldn't help but feel that I wasn't in the right place. Mm -hmm. Like my calling had always been to be in Africa, and it's a way to do science in Africa. Okay. Mm -hmm. After you finished your teaching, you decided to take up, take up a postdoc, so, which involved you moving from the US mm -hmm. to Kenya. Mm -hmm. So during that transition, what did you have to learn and what do you soft skills did you gain? Um, yeah, I mean, very quickly I realized that, you know, compared to the postdocs I'd observed in the U.S. during my PhD, being a postdoc at an African institution was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. There were certain responsibilities that, as a postdoc, you were expected to shoulder that you didn't really have to worry about in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You were, um, oftentimes, there were not that, you know, you were a small number of people. In the U.S., postdocs were almost as many as the graduate students. Mm -hmm. Some labs actually had more postdocs than graduate students. Uh, but in this case, I found coming to Kenya, even though it was a very well-established and well-funded institution, that the pyramid was a bit sharper. So you had a good number of trainees, master students, interns, some PhD students, and then a smaller number of, of people with PhDs who were postdocs or mm -hmm or group leaders. Um, and so as a postdoc, even if it was your first postdoc, you were expected to sort of shoulder certain admin or management responsibilities that you never really would have had to mm -hmm. um, in the US. Um, and that was a bit of a learning, a bit of an adjustment, because you couldn't just worry about your science. You had to worry about certain admin things. Mm -hmm. um, and then even the nature of the science you did, being in Africa, certain things you took for granted working in the States, um, I couldn't take for granted anymore. For instance, reagents, you know, that I could order and ship overnight would now take three or four months, so I had to plan way in advance, and I couldn't really change on the fly. Um, the cost was much, much more because you had to factor in shipping. Um, and so it really, as much as you want to do world, you know, globally competitive science, you realize all very quickly that you're up against significant hurdles mm -hmm. that are not your by you know not of your doing but that you have to sort of deal with. Um, and so I think that was the biggest thing, that the, the, the realization that even though I was in probably one of the best research centers on the continent, we still had to deal with certain challenges mm -hmm. that um, in many ways, at times, inhibited the, 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 the science you could yeah. do. You just couldn't be as flexible as um, colleagues you know, in other more developed parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was the biggest thing. And it was actually the, the challenge was 
finding ways to still do exciting globally competitive science factoring in the challenges. So yeah. you had to ramp up the way you thought you had to, you know, you had to work harder because you didn't want the quality of your science to yeah. drop while you had greater challenges. Probably had to be more critical as well in your planning. Yes, yeah. you had to, your time management had to be more important. You had to be more self critical also yeah. because you didn't have as many people around you <coughs> excuse me to sort of critique you you know mm -hmm. the environment usually you might you know you many places as a, a young postdoc you actually might be the expert mm -hmm. in what you're doing and that's a very different feeling you know you don't have the support of mm -hmm. senior mentors um, and so yeah you have to no one is there to tell you that you're not working hard enough or that your work is not quite as good as it could be mm -hmm. you have to be that voice or actively seek out mentors. Um, that was another thing. You have to go out there and acknowledge I don't know everything and they will help. But you have to go and find those mentors, whether locally or internationally, um, and establish those things. Well, I think one of the themes like yesterday was that this next generation of people who are now in their 20s and 30s <laughs> of yeah. post PhD mm -hmm. students, it's not a necessity to go out of mm -hmm. Africa to go to get a postdoc. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of advantages of staying mm -hmm. here in Africa. Mm -hmm. So, are you able to describe like a few advantages of being a postdoc here compared to going to the global? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think I would first of all say that the decision on whether to stay or go has to be it. It will vary from situation mm -hmm. to situation, and it, it depends a lot on the individual. Yeah. It also depends on the area of science. Mm -hmm. um, there are still particular areas that are really and if you are interested in those areas, you would have you still yeah. have to go abroad. Um, but I think certainly there are clear. There's been clearly a lot of development over the last ten years in the opportunities that exist. Um, and I mean, personally, the biggest advantage to staying here is you stay home. Mm -hmm. um, you remain rooted in your community. You have your support networks already established. Um, and I think that you cannot underestimate the importance of that. It's very isolating and mm -hmm. very lonely sometimes when you're out, you know, in a foreign place. The weather is different, the food yeah. is different, the middle of winter, um, you're lonely and cold, you know, and snowed in. And, snowed in. <laughs> um, and so that can be very difficult. Um, the way you get through it is to know why you are there. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have to be there, then I would recommend people begin to think um, certainly, um, I think there are, yeah, there are growing opportunities. Um, and for some of the work we do, actually, some of the subjects are better studied here. And I think that's something we have to remind ourselves of that going out there is not always the best thing. Um, if you study an infectious disease, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, um, or some other, you know, biomedical issue that is well represented on the continent, perhaps better represented here than elsewhere. There are clear advantages to developing a body of work globally. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I would say you have to think very carefully. There are advantages to going abroad. Certainly exposure mm -hmm. is very useful. Um, I, I think all the current success stories of African scientists, you, the thing they have in common mm -hmm. is they add exposure. So I would, I'm not against exposure. Um, I think what people need to factor in is the length of time. Perhaps we need to transition away from long two, three year stints abroad to maybe more fragmented blocks of time spent mm -hmm. doing a bit of research in a collaborative lab, returning home to do some work and going back. So very structured, targeted training periods as, mm -hmm. as opposed to long stretches. Um, yeah, because as I said yesterday, the biggest challenge to returning is leaving. Yeah. Um, and as we Many of us are passionate about trying to reverse or prevent brain death. Um, the biggest problem is when you go, things, life happens and people potentially, you know, um, end up staying for, for, for many reasons. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're somebody who is very keen to remain in Africa, then it has to be something that you consciously think about um, how you can design your postdoc to prepare you adequately to your transit. Yeah. Yesterday you talked about um, being rejected for one of the prestigious fellowships, yes. even though you and also your mentors and many people mm -hmm. you have consulted felt that you ticked all the boxes, mm -hmm. and you're taken aback by that failure. Mm -hmm. 
So what impact did that failure have on your general success now? Um, well, I think, first of all, you know, in, it maybe it was the first, in science, you have to realize that there will be times when you will not succeed yeah. the first time. That was the first time in my life, academically, that, or, you know, or, you know related to academic yeah. work, that I had not gotten what I had worked for. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it was a shock, but then you realize that science is extremely competitive. There are, at a certain level, everybody is very smart. So whereas, you know, early on in your education, you were at the top of the class and, you know, things came quite easily, as you continue to grow and specialize, you are now with everybody else who was also top of their class. Um, and so I think, in a way, yes, it was painful, but it was, first of all, it was a good lesson mm -hmm. that you don't always get. Nothing, that things don't always work out the way you plan, even if everybody around you is supportive and thinks you are fantastic. Perhaps you are fantastic, but there's just other fantastic people, and the way things fall that year, you don't get to know. Um, I think as a scientist, you have to get used to a certain amount of um, rejection or disappointment. Um, for me, it turned out to be fortuitous for the sake of the fact that I now look back and I don't think I was quite ready to be an independent scientist. That fellowship would have afforded me, it was a training fellowship, but it would have afforded me a certain amount of autonomy mm -hmm. and I looking back I think I wasn't ready for that. Um, not getting that fellowship actually provided me the you know in a way indirectly provided me the opportunity to do a long postdoc um, under very supportive and very good mentorship. And so personally not getting that postdoc that kind of that fellowship has turned out to be a very positive thing mm -hmm. because I feel it gave me the chance to mature. Um, it also, I guess, was a good lesson in rolling with the punches. As a scientist, you have to get used to the fact that you know, Nobel winning, Nobel Prize winning scientists have had grants rejected. Yeah. We all get grants rejected. It doesn't. You don't take it personally. It just makes you work harder for the next one. Um, so that was a good lesson. It's probably a lesson we all have to learn at yeah. some point. Um, but I also think young scientists, especially young African scientists, considering the environment we have to work in. Um, which is in many ways, you know, science is tough, but doing science in Africa, I think everybody, any, everybody will accept is tougher, mm -hmm. or at least there are more obstacles. I think young Africa scientists, as ambitious and driven as we are, we shouldn't be too eager to jump out of the nest before we're ready. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, conditions around us force us to grow up quickly. Um, that cannot always be avoided, but I think discussions I have with, with, with young PhD students who are keen to get started and change the world. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, taking an extra two years to do a postdoc in someone's group will not, you know, those two years will not prevent you from changing the world, but they might prepare you to actually have a better chance of yeah. success. Um, and so in my case, I think having that, that lag where I had to now do a postdoc again for four years actually turned out to be very, very good for me. Um, and so I advise people to think about how quickly you want to be independent. Yeah, you shouldn't rush too quick to be independent. No, don't rush, don't rush. There's so much that you learn in PhD that you then learn even more in your postdoc. Exactly. And yeah, you just, it doesn't, just because you're there fast doesn't mean you're already for it. Exactly. Yeah, just because you have the degree, even if you've got one postdoc, mm -hmm. you learn at different points. At some point, if you want to be an independent scientist, you have to take the plunge, and it's always a bit scary. Mm -hmm. But it's always good to ask yourself, be honest with yourself, and ask yourself how prepared I am. Mm -hmm. And I think within a certain window, whether it's you know three years or four years, within post your PhD, it's fine to be under someone's sort of umbrella mm -hmm. um, and be continue to be mentored. I mean, postdocs are still getting trained, yeah. and I think that's what we need to remember. Just because you have the PhD, it doesn't mean you're ready to be a PI. Um, and so I think I think that is something that African institutions need to work mm -hmm. more at. There's a lot of money for PhD training. And there's less funding for okay. fellowships uh, for postdocs. And I think that is a gap that I'm happy to see lately with initiatives from like the Academy of African Academy of Science and other areas. People are beginning to recognize that it's not just about getting the PhD, but mm -hmm. you need to provide protected time for post PhD training. What's the most enjoyable thing about being in academia? Like for you? 
Oh, the most enjoyable thing about being, you mean academia or being an African academic? Which one is? Both. Both. So you can separate it out if um, you want to. I mean, I've always enjoyed science. Even, you know, I knew I wanted to be a scientist from high school where I began to take science classes and I found myself fascinated mm -hmm. by how things work. Um, and being a practicing scientist basically gives you the opportunity to continue to explore. I mean, in a way, you are a lifelong student. Mm -hmm. um, and for some of us, that's very exciting. For some people, that might sound like, you know, well, why would you do that? But for me, I mean, that I like the idea of discovery. Um, but I'm also very conscious that I want, I want, I want to also make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that science affords me, with the talents that I am, I am born with, science is the best way for me to make a, a hopefully not too insignificant impact um, on my on my country on my continent, mm -hmm. um, and so I think, and it's especially an exciting time now. I believe, I firmly believe that this is sort of the dawn. I believe that we're seeing the emergence of African science in a way that has not existed before. Mm -hmm. All across the continent, there are growing numbers of young energetic scientists um, who are committed to really changing. The, the, or improving the, the lives of, of, of people in their country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we finally have got perhaps the makings of a critical mass to actually achieve something. In the past, there have been a few individuals who tried to make change and have had some success. But I think this is the first time you're finally seeing across Africa, diverse countries, you know, different levels of economic um, success in those countries, but there's a growing crop of, of really talented young African scientists. Um, so I think it's a great time. I'm really excited to be part of that movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, I think somebody said yesterday, the sky is not the limit, your, our minds are. And I think that well, now we need to take the ball and run with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm extremely excited. Okay. Thank you, y'all, for taking the time to be interviewed. Very happy.